the normal EPA study, and uh, I want to cover some aspects on physiology as well. Some tricks to measure AV intervals, abnormalities, false signals, responses to HCL and ventricular stimulation in terms of normal physiology, so we know what to expect in order to then understand what happens with certain pathologic conditions. So tricks to measure the his bundle electrogram. Just this is um, an example of a case where we have several recordings along from the his bundle into the right ventricle. And in all of them actually you can see spike in front of the main ventricular electrogram. And I think we should be aware that the best his recording is not the largest, but is the recording that has a largest atrial potential. Because we, if we want to measure the HV interval, we want to be as proximal as possible in the his bundle recording no matter how big the recording of the his is on itself. On the other hand, as you move into the ventricle, you really get a recording which is actually the right bundle potential. And there is a recording of the right bundle. Now, as we very well know that the HV interval in normal conditions have very strict uh, limits of normal between 35 and 55 milliseconds. <laughs> if our recording is too distal and it's actually a right bundle, we could think that the HV is really short. And then we will uh, start thinking that the patient actually has an accessory pathway, and that is because this is the condition that usually produces a short <coughs> HV interval. Now, another feature of this tracing is that you can see an APC here, and you can see the response. The response to an APC is an increase in the AH interval with similar HV interval, because as was mentioned this morning, the AV node is the um, area or the tissue where there is usually decremental conduction in response to faster stimulation. As you can see here, the AV node decrements to the point that if we pace faster enough, there is always block in the AV node at a certain rate, and you very well know that this is called the Wenke-Back cycle length or Wenke-Back rate if you want, and if you look carefully, there is increase in the H interval before the block, and particularly important as a characteristic of the Wenke-Back phenomenon is the decrease of the AH immediately after the block. That is what certainly characterizes the wake back phenomenon more specifically, because the, this nice prolongation is not always seen as in here. But this is totally different. What you can see here is that there is atrial stimulation, and this bit is not conducted to the ventricle. But why is it? Is it because of AV nodal block? No, because there is a his bundle here. Right? So then the block occurs at or below the his bundle location. And if this happens as here, with a slow pacing rate, this is very, very abnormal. In this particular case, there was also an abnormality in the recording of the his bundle itself. It's usually 
less than 25 milliseconds of duration, and as you can see here, it was 41 milliseconds in duration, the Higgs bundle potential. And it's also interesting to note, because then the question could be, is this infra his block, or is this intra his block? Right? We know there is a his potential, and there is no conduction, but it could be intra or infra his block. And we have here several features. One is that the QRS is narrow when there is conduction and all of a sudden is nothing. So for this to be infra his block, it would have to imply simultaneous block in the two bundles, which is very, very unusual. Right? It's more uh, logical to think that there is block in just one structure, which is the Hayes bundle. So this is in favor of intra his block rather than infra his block. Also, the Higgs bundle electron is abnormal itself. <clears throat> and also, the HV interval is prolonged. It's 65 milliseconds already in the bits that are conducting. So whole, this whole picture, ah, the other thing, finally, is that after block, the HV interval is the same. So there is no winky back type of behavior. It's not prolongation before uh, block and then shortening back of conduction. So all these features actually are in favor of intra his block in this particular example. Yes, please. Do you have an explanation for the A being so large? The, the, the what? The A. The A will uh, Well, it was... It was uh, the, the A changes every Oh, yeah. Well, you know, at the level of the of the his band of recording, the catheter is not stable, so there are some changes. I think that is what happens. This is... I, I agree with you. This is more distal. This is more proximal, but this is intermediate here. And now, I have a good case for you. You have to uh, answer a question, okay? In this, this is a young patient, actually, and uh, you can see that with a basic drive cycle length of 60, 600 milliseconds and a premature at 3.30, there is conduction, but there are two signals here. And you can question ourselves if there is his, another his, what's going on. Now, in this same patient, we induce the tachycardia. And you can tell that there is a very short VA interval. So features are consistent with avian reentry. But also during tachycardia, there are two signals here, right? The atrium is here, but there are two additional signals. If you look carefully, there are some changes in the intervals between the two signals. This is 41 milliseconds here, 73, 56, <coughs> despite the tachycardia being regular. So the question I have for you is what is the most likely mechanism for these two signals? If you think there is rate-related intrahis conduction delay, or rate-related his to right bundle conduction delay, or if you think it is an artifact. And not only that, if it is an artifact, if you think so, because the cycle length of the tachycardia remains constant, or if you think so, because the VA interval remains constant during the tachycardia. Can we go back to the tracing for one second? 
I told you that the tachycardia was regular. Can we go one, one uh, go back one slide? Yeah. Okay, you have the two signals here. Tachycardia regular. VA interval stays the same. Let's vote, please. We've got 56 votes. Not bad. Okay, wow. <laughs> Perfect random voting. <laughs> Okay, let me have the next slide. VA, if you measure at the, for example, the high right atrium, is 80 milliseconds and was constant, right? Now just think for a moment. What happens if there is intrahest delay during avenal reentry? If there is intrahest delay, the tachycardia rate is the same. But the VA interval changes. VA interval is approximately zero most of the time, or so minus 10 in avenal reentry. If there is intrahist delay, then the A is before the V, right? Because there is intrahist delay. So what surprises in this tracing is that not just that the cycle length is the same. What is against intrahist delay is that the VA is the same. Remember, there were different, different delays. The 56, 41, 73. We should have expected different VA intervals if it was, in fact, intrahist delay. So this is very unlikely to be intrahist delay. We have to think it's an artifact. But because of that, right? Not because, right? This is against because of that. So the most likely explanation is an electronic artifact. And then the second uh, question could be what, which of the two is the artifact? And it's actually the first, because the second one bears a constant relation to the ventricular electrogram. So it's the first one that is an artifact. So you have to be aware that we, when we have catheters in the heart and the heart is moving, particularly in young patients, I think it's more likely to have electronic artifacts because the, the movement is more vigorous. Now, a few words about physiology. We talked about anterograde physiology and now about retrograde physiology. Uh, and this is not so commonly understood, and I want to emphasize a little bit on that. First of all, in response to ventricular extra stimuli, we have recording of the HIST bundle. During ventricular pacing, the HIST bundle is usually recorded before the local ventricular electrogram. It's small deflection right in front of the ventricular electron. Why? Because the conduction through the Hesperkinje system is faster than conduction through the ventricle itself. So if, you, if we pace the apex of the right ventricle, we get conduction through the right bundle, and we get conduction through the ventricle at the same time. Conduction through the right, right bundle gets to the haze before conduction to the ventricle gets to the local ventricular electrogram at the same site. Okay, so that's why the haze is in front of the local ventricular electrogram most of the times. And that happens with premature beats identical. However, please note that when the coupling interval gets shorter, eventually the Hess bundle electrogram is recorded after the local ventricular electrogram. And that is very consistent. You will see that all the time. If you are careful enough to look for retrograde his. Some people don't care about retrograde his. I think it's important to care about retrograde his. And if the coupling interval gets even shorter, the, mo the his moves even farther away to the local ventricular electron. Why is this? We believe that most of the times this is because 
at a certain capping interval, the refractoriness of the right bundle in the retrograde direction is achieved. And conduction goes over the septum and then over the left bundle up to the his. Just remember that normally the refractory period of the right bundle tends to be a little bit longer than the refractory period of the left bundle. That we, when, that's why we see more often right bundle branch block aberration in general. So the same thing happens retrogradely. And if there is block, there's re, block because of refractoriness in the right bundle, then there is this, bi this big jump of the His potential, and now it's described after the local ventricular electrogram. However, even with shorter intervals, this can, the VA interval can increase even more. And this is normal physiology. This is not any abnormality. With a different basic cycle length, the same thing happens. At a certain capping interval, the His bundle is recorded after the local ventricular electrogram. And if you keep shortening the capping interval, eventually there is retrograde VH block. You see there is no H here now anymore. So there is eventually block also in the retrograde left bundle. When that happens, there is, no, it's, there is no VA conduction, obviously, because there is black at the level of the Purkinje system, obviously in the absence of an accessory pathway that happens. So when we use extra stimuli, the normal behavior is increasing VH and eventually black in the His Purkinje system retrogradely. In contrast, when the response to continuous ventricular pacing is very different. In the response to continuous ventricular pacing, the usual site of block is, as you can see here, there is no A, but there is a HES. So the retrograde site of block now is what? The AV node, right? There is retrograde HES, but no A. So now it's blocked in the AV node. Just consider the difference here. Here's no HES, and here is a HES, but no A. So there is typical Wenke back, retrograde Wenke back in the AV node. So in summary, in response to ventricular extra stimuli, as, cycle length, as a coupling interval decreases, VH interval increases, eventually with a sudden increase due to retrograde block in the right bundle and going up the left bundle. VH interval increases after that progressively and eventually there is a block retrogradely. HA tends to remain constant with extra stimuli. However, in response to continuous ventricular pacing, VH tends to remain constant and block tends to occur in the AV node. So please note there is very different behavior, extra stimuli versus continuous pacing. So my question now, the most common mechanism of a sudden increase in the S2, A2 interval in response to ventricular extra stimuli under physiologic conditions is conduction delay in the AV node, conduction block in the AV node, conduction delay in the right bundle, conduction block in the right bundle, or conduction delay in the ventricular muscle to Purkinje junction. What do you think? Sudden increase in S2E2 in response to ventricular extra stimuli. Come on, we got 56 before. 54 now. Almost. We need the 56. Okay. Just remember, we said that in response to ventricular extra stimuli, the, the, the problem or the conduction uh, change 
tends to occur in the right bundle. And actually, conduction delay could be, but for such an uh, important jump that is usually seen in the VH, I think that is more usually conduction block what occurs. So I would think is the, is, uh, the correct is number four. Thank you. Can we go ahead? Okay, so that was for physiology. Now about pace mapping. What are the principles of pace mapping? The principle is that if a rhythm originates from a certain spot within the heart, and I don't care if it is atrial or ventricular, the spot, pacing from the same site will originate electrical activation in an identical fashion as recorded from the 12 lead ECG. Okay? Because we are pacing from the same spot, so activation is expected to proceed in an identical fashion. However, the, the principle is easy and is nice, but it's not so easy in real practice. Why is not so easy? A number of considerations. First, I said from a certain spot, but however, what happens if the rhythm is re-entrant? It's not really spot. Okay, so just from that, we should suspect that this tool is better to localize focal rhythms than to localize re-entrant rhythms. Now, another question. Should pacing be performed during sinus rhythm or during tachycardia? Is this important? Should pacing be unipolar or bipolar? We have heard before that there are different ways of pacing the heart. How about the output? Is that a question that matters? We know that if the output is above threshold and is actually high above threshold, we can actually capture an area that is not exactly the myocardium surrounding the tip of the catheter, but it's a bigger area. That is what is called the virtual electrode. And the virtual electrode can be much higher or much larger than the actual electrode. And what is the spatial resolution that we can expect from that? Because we are finally looking at the ECG. And maybe pacing from areas that are closely located actually could produce very similar ECG signals. And finally, how is this change or these changes or the evaluation uh, uh, approximated? Okay, so these are the different considerations I think we have to have in mind. Let me just make a few comments about them. First, unipolar versus bipolar. Unipolar theoretically is better. The problem is that, as you know, that uh, unipolar uh, pacing produces such a big artifact that really distorts the ECG signal to an extent that I think makes it less easy to evaluate. So in my opinion, at least what I do is use bipolar pacing because it's more practical. Now the output I think is an important consideration and ideally should be kept as close as possible to threshold. So when we, when we do pace mapping, it's not just put 10 milliamps on any spot we want to try. I don't think that's a good thing to, a good way to do it. I think that for each spot we should start pacing and then increase slowly the output until it starts capturing or the opposite, go down. But uh, finally evaluate um, an output that is quite close to threshold. The spatial resolution has been looked at mostly for ventricular stimulation and using diagnostic catheters in normal heart, it was found to be around 15 millimeters. 
In other words, when two spots are more than 15 millimeters away, it's easy to tell that the ECG looks different. If it is less than 15 millimeters, it's not so clear. With ablation catheters and using a more sophisticated computerized analysis, this distance went down to about 10 millimeters. So, but anyway, we have to keep in mind that we are not exactly so precise as to tell this is exactly the spot. So that's why uh, we should not expect from pace mapping to be uh, so precise as we want to. And then in the discussion in relation to if pacing during tachycardia or during sinus rhythm, and if the rhythm is reentrant versus the rhythm being focal. If the rhythm is focal, it doesn't matter. We can pace sinus rhythm, we can pace uh, during tachycardia. I think it's good to pace at a similar rate as the rate of the tachycardia, but it doesn't really matter too much. However, in relation to reentry, I think it's important to consider this very, very simple scheme of uh, re-entrant rhythm, just uh, think if we pace during re-entry, then because of the principles of entrainment, and I will discuss about that in a, in a couple of minutes, because of the principles of entrainment, the impulse cannot exit in the direction opposite to the direction of re-entry because there is collision here. So the only way that the impulse can exit is in an identical direction as during tachycardia. So during pacing, we are OK. If we pace at the area of slow conduction or the protected area of reentry, we could produce an activation and consequently an ECG morphology of a, a QRS of P or P wave that is identical as during tachycardia. So it's good during tachycardia to use this principle. However, if, because this is going this way, however, if we pace during uh, sinus rhythm, there is no more this collision here, and exit can occur in both directions. And if that happens, then the ECG could look very different. So that's why the principle of pace mapping for re-entrant rhythms during sinus rhythm, very careful. You have to be very careful because it could be very misleading, even pacing at a protected area. Is that clear? Because the, 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 I, I'm, I'm missing on the slide. <laughs> There should be on a slide that there is no, no opposite wavefront. Okay, the only sign of rhythm, this is not here anymore. So exit is both sides. The slide is missing for some reason. But uh, was that clear? Okay. And finally, how to evaluate? How to evaluate if a pace mapping is good or bad compared to the signal we have during tachycardia? It's very difficult to evaluate in a quantitative way. And most people are evaluating in a semi-quantitative way. And the most simple way is to consider each lead and say if each lead of ECG is good or bad. If it is good, and is good in how many of the leads? Out of the 12, you get 11 out of 12, 10 out of 12. This is all this, this business. However, how to evaluate each lead specifically? Um, mainly for research papers, this, um, the changes have been categorized into major changes or minor changes. And this is obviously arbitrary, but I'm going to tell you what has been used. A major change is the appearance or disappearance or a change in the amplitude of a component of the ECG that is more than 50% of the QRS amplitude. 
a minor change would be a change that basically is similar to this, but with a uh, change that is less than 25% change of a um, uh, component of the ECG. It's not easy to, to apply. I think that sometimes it's easier just to look at the ECG and get a qualitative idea. And another way to quantify the changes is what, is, what has been called the SCORE method, and is to evaluate each lead and say if it is identical to the tachycardia or if there are only minor changes, and then you get score one, and, or if there are major changes and you get score zero. And if it is identical, identical you, can, you get score two. So then since we have 12 leads, the best score would be 24 points. If there is, for example, one lead that is only different and uh, with a minor difference, it would be 23. Let's, uh, let me show you an example here so we can get more familiar with the concept. On the left panel, you see a VPC, and then we have paste from three different sites. So these are three different pace mapping sites that should be compared to the ECG of the VPC here. Okay? Now, if you look carefully, number one site is very bad. Just look at lead one, for example. It's very different in lead one. Lead two and three, okay. There are some differences, but not, not much. This may be considered very similar. But then if you look carefully V1, V2, there is a small R wave here that is lost during pacing. And lead V3 is very different as well. So this is a bad site. Site 2 is not so bad. This is more similar to this. This is getting more similar. Now we have a small little R wave in V1, not in V2. So it will be a better site. And pace mapping site three is actually very good. You see that the QRS is very, it's not identical, but it's very, very similar to lead one. And this is very similar again lead to lead three. Now we have the R wave in V1, V2. So this will be a good pace mapping site for this VPC. Now, just for you to get more familiar with using the score, which I'm not sure if it is very important or not, but just to get an idea, if you use the score, which is, I think, is, a, is a, the better way to do it, up to 24 points, how would you score this site? And this is a question for you. How many points would you be giving to this site? 24 points, which is the best. 20 points, 15, only 6, or 0 points. Just remember, if there are only minor changes, it's score 1. If there are major changes for one lead, it's score 0 for each lead. And you have to add up the 12 leads. And remember, in general, major changes, more than 50% change in a component of the ECG, minor changes, 25% or less. Or a change in shape could also be a minor change, but a significant change in shape of a major component of the ECG. As I said, this is more, I think, a research tool but I think it's important to have some idea of how we evaluate pace mapping. So what score would you give to this site? 53 volts, good. 55 volts, great. Okay, very good, I would agree with that. I would agree because if you consider lead one, okay, lead one would be zero, lead V3 is zero, so we are going up to 20 the most, and then there are like V1, V2, 
there is a minor change because there is a loss of this component that is less than than 50 percent so we get two other points less and then i agree with you that i will also uh, for example count one here and one here so it's around 15 i agree with that okay and the final part of my talk relates to the topic of entrainment this is one of my favorite topics in electrophysiology um, to some extent it's difficult, I understand, but I think uh, that I would like you to get familiar at least with the principles and at least on um, understanding why is this concept important in electrophysiology. First of all, I would like to make the point of what is the essence, the essence of transient entrainment. The essence of the concept is that during pacing, obviously pacing during a regular rhythm, a tachycardia, all the tissue of the pace chamber and the chamber where the tachycardia originates is activated at the pacing rate. Okay? All the tissue gets activated at the pacing rate. And for that to occur, there has to be an interaction between the pacing waveform and the tachycardia mechanism. That's for sure, because otherwise it's impossible. But when we stop pacing, the tachycardia continues unaltered. So the same tachycardia continues. That's why uh, Waldo, that described the concept, always talked about transient entrainment, because it's a transient phenomenon during pacing. And what is interesting is that if you look at the clock of the tachycardia, the clock is permanently altered. But the tachycardia is not altered. It's just the timing that is altered, the clock of the tachycardia. This is easier to analyze with resetting than with entrainment, because resetting is basically just this phenomenon for one bit. And it's easier for us to understand. This is resetting. It's very simple. You have to believe me that the tachycardia was regular, cycling 400. There is one extra stimulus here. And the tachycardia continues unaltered, 400 milliseconds. Same rate, same morphology. However, Nothing happened? No, something happened. What happened was that this bit comes earlier than expected. If nothing would have happened, this would be 800 milliseconds, right? 400 twice, 800 milliseconds. However, it's not 800, it's 760. And if you repeat the same um, extra stimulus, you will get the same response. It's a very, very reproducible response. Resetting is very reproducible. So what happens is that this post-pacing interval is less than fully compensatory. If it had been fully compensatory, this here would have been 800. And now you understand very well what I told you about the clock of the tachycardia. You have the clock here. And the clock should be 800, 1,200. And it's not 1,200 anymore. It's 1160. And here is not 1,600 anymore. It's 1,560. So the clock is permanently altered, it's changed, but the tachycardia stays the same, right? Why can this happen if the rhythm is re-entrant? I have never s said that for resetting to occur, the rhythm has to be re-entrant. No. The sinus rhythm can be reset, and sinus rhythm is not re-entrant so far. Right? Sinus rhythm is not a re-entrant rhythm. But if the rhythm is re-entrant, 
how can we explain resetting? And the way it's explained is shown here. Pacing in this particular example was performed away from the circuit. You have a circuit represented here. This represents a, um, a protected area inside. This is a, an unexcitable obstacle, for example, and reentry occurs <coughs> activating the, the tissue in this direction. At one point during reentry, there is exit to the surrounding myocardium. So there is an area where the circuit is not protected. Okay? So now if we pace outside from the circuit, we create an activation wavefront. And if we pace at the right time, if we pace early enough, the activation wavefront has time to access to the tachycardia circuit at a time that it is excitable. Because here, the red part, the, sorry, the black part here means refractoriness after the activation wavefront. But the white part is excitable. So since it is excitable, this wavefront access the tachycardia circuit. Now in the heart, conduction tries to go in all directions. So it will go in the same direction as during tachycardia, which is usually called orthodromic conduction, but also tries to go in the antidromic direction, which is against the direction as it goes during tachycardia. Now, what I, what I want you to note here is that the antidromic wavefront has to collide for sure, always, with the activation that is going on during the tachycardia, because we said that the pacing was performed during tachycardia. So there is an activation of the circuit. And this collision results in nothing. Collide, and that's it. So what finally happens is that the only activation that continues is the orthodromic wavefront generated by this paced wavefront. So the final result is that when the impulse during the tachycardia was here, all of a sudden it's here. So there is short circuiting. We have advanced the activation by this amount of time. The impulse of the tachycardia was here, right? But exactly at this time, it's here. We have skipped part of the circuit. That's why the next, the next bit will appear here early. So we advance by a certain amount because we have skipped part of the circuit. And this is resetting. And entrainment is exactly the same, but many times. If we, after this one bit, we introduce a second one, a third one, that is exactly the same phenomenon, but just X number of times. Just to show you um, how do we look at this and how can we recognize that and how can we use it? Those are the questions that we have to ask ourselves. Let me start by saying that the way that we can recognize that these are criteria for recognition, this is not the essence of the phenomenon, this is the recognition criteria. Actually, these four criteria were described by Waldo and his group. The first one is to look for constant fusion bits during pacing. That the bits in pacing are actually fused bits. The second principle, the second criterion is progressive fusion. And that is, if you entrain at a faster rate, you get a different degree of fusion as 
with a slower rate. So fusion is progressive, is rate dependent. And there are two other criteria that are a bit more complicated. One is that shorter conduction time is associated with termination, and I will show you an example in a minute. And finally, is to detect fusion in relation to observation in local electrons. I'm not going to go over this particularly, but let me just show examples of constant and progressive fusion, and that is what is this example. This example is ventricular tachycardia. Panel A is during the tachycardia. Panel B is pacing during sinus rhythm. There is no tachycardia. This is just pacing from the right ventricular apex. And panels C, D, and E are panels that show pacing during tachycardia but at different cycle lengths. This is 350, this is 310, and this is 260. Please note that at all three different pacing rates, when pacing is stopped, the tachycardia continues and continues unaltered, right? However, look at the mystery of this phenomenon. Now, if you look at the QRS, for example, look at lead V1 pacing from the same side, the apex, in, the th in these three panels. Look at V1. It's different. It's different. We are pacing from the same side. Why should it be different? And all of them are different from pacing during sinus rhythm. Why should this be different? And why should this be different in between them? is because they are fused bits. All of these QRSs are fused, are fusion bits. However, if you look at two bits at the same rate, they are the same. So fusion is constant. It's constant at each particular rate. However, at different rates, the morphology changes. So fusion is progressive. At a different rate, you get a different degree of fusion. Why is that? Let me show you an example here. This is the same scheme I showed you before, but now we look at the result of what happens with this activation wavefront. Now, the activation wavefront, as it reaches the exit site, obviously will exit to the surrounding myocardium, right? But the interesting phenomenon here is that at the same time as this is occurring, the paced wavefront is actually entering the circuit. So these two wavefronts occur at the same time, but result from different impulses. This is the result of the paced impulse, and this is the result of the tachycardia wavefront exiting to the surrounding myocardium. But you can tell that this is the definition of fusion. Fusion means that the chamber is activated by two different wavefronts. It's like, for example, in WBW, there is pre-excitation and there is the normal wavefront. It's a fused QRS. So this is the same. It's a fused QRS complex, two activation wavefronts. And you can easily, from this, deduct that if you pace faster, then this interval, this, this um, activation wavefront, will occur early in relation to this one. So you will get a different degree of fusion because then more part of the myocardium will become activated by the pace wavefront and less by the tachycardia wavefront. So that is why it's rate related. As you pace faster, you get a different degree of fusion. One of the important consequences of this whole phenomenon is that we can 
map to some extent if our base in sight is close or far away from a circuit. And that is by the analysis of what it's usually called the post-pacing interval. Why is that? Just think for a moment. If we pace from the circuit, if we pace from the circuit, the activation next time of this site will be will occur at an interval that is identical to the tachycardia cycle length because we are pacing inside the circuit. However, if we pace at a distance, then there is time to get from the pacing site to the circuit, time around the circuit, and time, conduction time back from the circuit to the pacing site. So here, the post-pacing interval will measure more than the tachycardia cycle length. What more? If we are, if, the, if this conduction time is longer, the PPI will exceed the tachycardia cycle length by a larger amount. So the PPI, evaluation of PPI, is what has been generally called entrainment mapping. Because by pacing from different sites, we can tell if we are far from the circuit or close to the circuit. Obviously, these are conduction times. They are not distances. But if the PPI is identical to the tachycardia cycle length, we must be very, very, very close to the circuit, or inside the circuit, actually. Now, that could be a question for you. Resetting of a tachycardia by a single extra stimuli, extra stimulus, number one, implies that the rhythm is re-entrant, implies that there is interaction between the basic rhythm and extra stimuli, or doesn't have any implication per se. What do you think? Resetting of a tachycardia by a single extra stimuli. Single extra stimulus. Do you think that implies that the rhythm is re-entrant? just implies that there is an interaction or no, no implications. Okay, 56, very good. 57, wow. 61. Even Richard voted this time. <laughs> okay, yeah, just remember that I said before that the sinus node can be reset. So what really tells that this a reentrant rhythm is to have resetting with fusion or entrainment with fusion. But just resetting can occur for a focal rhythm. For example, a pacemaker rhythm, VVI pa pacemakers are reset if there is a normal uh, sinus beat, for example. Okay, let's go ahead. And I, the, the, the final two, three minutes of the talk will be to deal with practical implications of entrainment or, you know, uh, in what um, substrate. Can, can I have the next slide? Have that been used? To be, I will skip that because this is the third criterion. Is, is quite, I will go to this. Utility of entrainment as a diagnostic tool. As I mentioned before, entrainment with fusion equals reentry, and that is um, the first um, interesting aspect of this is to be able to um, be sure that the rhythm is reentrant. But then it has been used, and I always also discuss that post pacing interval proximity to the circuit. However, the presence or absence of fusion have been used for a differential diagnosis between avial reentry or reentry involving an accessory pathway that is septal or right lateral. And also for distinction between right and left atrial tachycardias.
and even for a rapid suggestion about the differential diagnosis of supraventricular tachycardia. I don't have time to go over, over this, <coughs> but just remember that if there is fusion, that is because, as in my scheme, there was a distance between the exit from the tachycardia and the entrance of the paced impulses. And that happens when we pace from the ventricle and we have an accessory pathway. We can have fusion. This is a nice example. This is actually entrainment of a supraventricular tachycardia. And then you can, uh, you uh, yes, uh, you are not sure because there is concentric activation. But if you look at the QRS morphology, you can tell this is fusion because we are pacing from the right ventricular apex. You should never expect upright QRS in lead two, right? From the right ventricular apex. You can tell me, this is a wrong label. This is not the apex. This is the alpha track. No, it was the apex. But fusion makes that the QRS is upright in lead two because it's not a paced QRS, it's a fused QRS, okay? And you can see that for some um, accessory pathway mediated tachycardias, but you will never see that in avinal reentry. Never, in avinal reentry. Why? Because between the circuit and the ventricle, there is only the his bundle. There are no entrance and exit. There is only one bundle, so you cannot have fusion. That's why this the distinction was made, and this is an important paper that showed that by looking at the PPI, we can distinct, we can, we can differentiate uh, right from left atrial tachycardias, obviously pacing from the right atrium. From the right atrium, you will have short PPIs if the tachycardia is uh, in the right atrium. In left atrial tachycardia, you will have longer PPIs. And finally, our group has worked on the distinction between avinal reentry and um, accessory pathway mediated tachycardias by looking at the PPI. It's very long. The PPI is very long for avinal reentry and tachycardias, and it's very short. You see, 23 milliseconds for septal accessory pathways. So it's just another way to distinguish between them, and there was, there was a um, clear difference here. And just um, three references for you if you want to go over the topics of my talk. And uh, I finished. <laughs> Is there any discussion?